On June 20th, 1937, a very unusual plane landed at Pearson Field in Vancouver, Washington. Many things made this airplane unusual, to begin with the fact that unexpectedly for everyone, whether the people on the streets or the personnel of the base, the airplane was Soviet. It was the ANT-25, which had left Moscow and, after more than 63 hours of flight time, reached the territory of the USA, marking the world's first transpolar flight. For its time, this flight was an extraordinary event by itself, and yet just a couple of weeks later, a second Soviet-made ANT-25 landed, now in California, setting the world record for flight distance. These two events were events of great importance for world transportation as a whole, with the establishment of a shorter route between the two continents, but also for two countries involved, the USA and the USSR, which just three years earlier had established diplomatic relations. However, in this case, the most interesting part was the airplanes that Soviet Russia decided to send to the USA to establish what they called the Air Bridge of Friendship. The record-breaking AMT-25s, which were so sincerely welcomed by the American public on their soil, were in a way long-range bombers. But the most frightening thing was that the main armament of these bombers was not conventional bombs, but chemical weapons. The 1930s were a time of rapid development of aviation, accompanied by a fiery competition to set various records, particularly for flight distance, which resulted in the creation of special air machines. One such machine was the Soviet NT-25, designed by Andrei Tupolev. However, if the NT-25 is well known to the public for completing the transpolar flights, the dark side of this remarkable aircraft is less well known. It had an evil twin brother, the DB-1 bomber. To be fair, the idea of using record-breaking airplanes as bombers did not belong to the USSR. In this case, the Russians were just blindly copying the concept being developed by France with the Bernard 82 bomber and Britain with the Vickers Wellesley bomber, which, by the way, would set a new flight distance record a year after the Russians. At the time, the idea seemed obvious. If there was an airplane that was capable of flying great distances, why not load it with bombs, giving the Air Force a, so to say, long stick? But unlike France and Britain, the most peaceful country in the world, as the Soviet Union liked to call itself, decided to go a little further by turning its long-range bomber into a weapon of mass destruction by having it carry chemical weapons. Back in 1933, the year when the ANT-25 airplane existed only on draft papers and in Andrei Tupolev's mind, Yakov Alksnitz, the commander of the Red Army Air Forces, received a report from the chief of the military chemical department of the Soviet Army for military implementation of the new ANT-25 aircraft currently in development. The idea was that since the ANT-25 had the huge fuel tanks required to set a flight distance record, why not use some of the tank space to carry chemical substances? It was proposed that the new chemical bomber would fly to a target, say some European city, and spray chemical substances directly from its wings over the target. Sort of like the ordinary agricultural planes that many of you have probably seen. Apparently, Jakob Alksnitz liked the idea because he approved the proposal, leaving on the document his resolution to also work out the idea of using the ANT-25 as a conventional bomber. Thus began the dark side of the history of the legendary ANT-25 aircraft, an aircraft which in many ways opened Soviet Russia to the Americans. What not so many realize to this day is that the fate of discovering Russia for themselves was planned not only for the USA, but for other countries as well, primarily European ones. I know, it's very difficult for mentally healthy people to consume passages from Russian propaganda, but unfortunately this is necessary to understand history. As you know, from the very first day of its existence, the USSR called itself the most peaceful country which never wanted even a single piece of foreign land, and all it wanted was only to defend the sacred Russian way of life from evil enemies that circled the USSR on all sides. But interestingly enough, at the very same time, the Russians have always truly believed that their way of life is so great that they must bring it to their neighbors, even if the neighbors don't want it. 
for the Russians, their neighbors' resistance to Russian ideas comes solely from a lack of understanding of the joy of living like a Russian. And if in order to change their minds the neighbors must be exterminated, then this is fine too. And thus, back in the 1930s, the USSR started building a huge army to defend itself from possible invasion while expanding its own territories at the same time. I do understand how hard it is for a healthy mind to process these two statements at the same time, but watch this episode from the 1938 movie The Great Citizen. Республика так из 30-40. Черт его знает, как хорошо. So according to this idea, the peaceful USSR had to enter into and then win some good war, which for any normal peaceful country would mean a defensive war against an enemy invasion. However, by means of this good war, the USSR, which at the time consisted of 11 republics, would suddenly grow to consist of 40 republics. And if you think that this is just some regular meaningless movie, you are very wrong. In the USSR, all the movies existed in one and only one form – propaganda. Each and every movie was subject to the strictest censorship, so every action or word in the movie meant that it was approved at the very highest level. In the case of the movie The Great Citizen, it is well known that Joseph Stalin personally edited the movie script, enough to be added as a scriptwriter in the final credits, but as we all know, Joseph Stalin was very humble. Anyway, in the 1930s, the USSR was intensively preparing for a big war, or if paraphrased in Russian terms, uh, for the reception of new Soviet republics. To be fair, deep inside, the Russians very well realized that other nations were not eager to join the USSR. The Russians quickly learned this from their own experience with the Polish, after shamefully losing the 1920 Polish-Soviet war. Moreover, although it is certainly hard to believe today, even some Russians did not want to follow the Russian way of life, such as the people involved in one of the biggest peasant rebellion, the Tambov Uprising of 1921. To suppress the peasants who rebelled against the government that put them on the brink of starvation by extorting all the grain, the Soviet leadership sent more than 40,000 soldiers. There was some evil irony in the fact that the Tambov peasants were killed by the Workers and Peasants Red Army, created specifically to protect workers and peasants. And while suppressing the rebelling peasants, the Red Army used not only infantry but also armored cars, artillery, aviation and even chemical weapons. Apparently, the USSR appreciated the results of using chemical warfare because it was then decided to devote significantly more attention to the development of these kinds of weapons. There was only one problem with this intention, however. The very same problem whether we are speaking of Russia in the 1920s or the 2020s. They lack the technologies to carry out complex warfare. Today, for these purposes, Russia has such friends as Iran and North Korea, but in the 1920s it was Germany who came to help. On May 14, 1923, the USSR and Germany signed a secret agreement according to which the Germans would help to build up the production of mustard gas and phosgene. In return, part of this product was to be secretly delivered to Germany. This cooperation, disguised as a Soviet-German fertilizer company Bersol, successfully worked for three years, after which the Russians, who apparently by the time had learned all necessary technologies, broke the agreement and decided to produce these fertilizers only for themselves. In the following years, the production of chemical compounds grew at a tremendous pace. For example, on July 10, 1936, the Soviet Minister of Heavy Industry, Sergo Arjenikidze, signed Secret Order No. 195 on increasing the production of chemical warfare compounds. The order prescribed the development of new production facilities for an annual output of 129,000 tons of mustard gas, as well as other compounds. For comparison, in 1918, which was the peak year of the combat use of chemical weapons in World War I, all chemical plants in France, taken together, produced a little more than 2,000 tons of mustard gas, which is almost 65 times less than the Soviet plan for mustard gas, not counting the thousands of tons of other compounds. In order to deliver all this chemical variety to the countries that were to become the new Soviet republics, the USSR developed and built almost two dozens of special bomber DB-1, 
which however all of a sudden turned out to be absolutely useless for this role. On June 22, 1933, Mikhail Gromov and his crew took to the sky in the new NT-25, or as it was also called, the RD, Record of Distance. The aircraft was created specifically to set a world record for flight distance. Following the first one, the second aircraft, designated RD-2, was soon handed over for flight tests. The new aeroplanes had quite an unusual design, in particular huge wings, which were used for carrying enormous amounts of fuel. This resulted in the NT-25 having great difficulty taking off and requiring a long takeoff run. The test pilots joked that the NT-25 took off in the air thanks to the curvature of the planet. To address this problem, by the order of the Soviet Air Force commander, a 2-kilometer-long concrete runway was built not far from Moscow, which became the very first of its kind in the USSR and is known today as Chkalovsky Air Base. However, even this wasn't enough for the NT-25, and so a special acceleration hill was built at the end of the runway. The hill was 6 meters high and 150 meters long and was supposed to provide the NT-25 with additional acceleration. But even this wouldn't help with the NT-25's awfully slow gain of altitude after liftoff and therefore for safety reasons, 2,000 soldiers in just two weeks managed to level a small hill which was in the way of the NT-25 takeoff path. After learning this uh, yet another instance of Russian Smikalka, one might ask, instead of leveling that hill, why not simply take off in the opposite direction? And maybe even use that natural hill as an acceleration point? Or if there are hills on all sides everywhere, why build a new airfield in that area in the first place? I don't know what to say. I can only quote the old Ukrainian expression, thank you God for I am not Russian. Anyway, the first NT-25 tests showed that the flight performance of the new aeroplane was much worse than expected. The aeroplane clearly needed multiple improvements, which to be fair was not something extraordinary on the new aeroplane development stage. What was interesting, however, is that on the report of the aircraft's state trials appeared a note from the Soviet Air Force commander stating that all the improvements to be developed for the NT-25 should be applied to the aircraft's military version as well. The planes were indeed significantly improved and on June 30th the NT-25, piloted by Mikhail Gromov, went on its first long-distance experimental flight. Interestingly enough, one of the tasks for this experiment specified the need to confirm the matter of meeting the technical requirements for the military version of the aircraft. After taking off from an airfield near Moscow, the plane headed for Crimea, then it turned around and headed back for Moscow again, on the way dropping at one of the test sites a 1000 kg dummy bomb load. After reaching Moscow, the aircraft headed for Crimea once again, but due to a fuel system malfunction, it was forced to stop the flight, which lasted for 27 hours. Although the attempt of a long-distance flight had failed, the first practical result was nevertheless achieved. The possibility of using the NT-25 as a bomber with a range of 2,000 km was confirmed. In 1934, after a few more improvements to the NT-25 and successful long-distance test flights, the Soviet leadership issued an order to launch serial production of its bomber version, which received the designation NT-36. In the Air Force, the aircraft was named the DB-1, which stands for Long Range Bomber No. 1. In comparison to the civil NT-25, the bomber version received some additional navigation and bombardment equipment, machine guns for protection and of course a bomb bay for 10 100kg bombs. However, the primary armament of the DB-1 was not bombs but mustard gas. For this purpose, the volume of the wing fuel tanks, which amounted to 6100 liters, was reduced to 4900 liters, and the vacated capacity of 1200 liters was now intended for chemical compounds, which were to be sprayed out over the target directly from the aircraft's wings. The large amount of fuel provided the Soviet chemical bomber with a formidable combat radius of 2000 km, which meant that the DB-1 could take off from the Soviet territory and easily deliver its poisonous cocktail to most of the European capitals, whether Paris, Rome or London, not to mention Warsaw, Prague, Berlin or Budapest. The first serial-produced DB-1 was built and tested in 1935. 
However, the military commission refused to accept it because it was clearly unsuitable for operation in the Air Force due to its awful production quality. The same fate evaded the next seven airplanes, which at best required serious adjustments and fixes. Given that Russian-built airplanes historically have always been of abominable quality, I can't even imagine how bad the DB-1s were if the military refused to take them. Anyway, out of 18 serial bombers built, only 10 machines were eventually transferred to the Special Squadron of the 11th Bomber Aviation Brigade. But as it soon appeared, the poor assembly quality was the least of its problems, since it suddenly became clear that the new chemical bomber DB-1 turned out to be completely useless in the role it was meant for. To be honest, I don't know why the Russians didn't test the concept of the chemical bomber before actually building 18 of them. It turned out that to use mastered gas tanks, the DB-1 could only be used at altitudes of no higher than 200 meters. Otherwise, the chemical compounds were dispersed in the air and spread by the wind, without creating dangerous concentrations on the ground. But a low-altitude attack with the DB-1 would be simply insane. Its 34 meters wingspan and speed of slightly over 200 km per hour made the DB-1 an easy target for anything that could shoot, whether it be just infantry armed with rifles, machine guns or other way more powerful anti-aircraft weapons. It turned out that the DB-1 could not be used as a conventional bomber either, since neither its maximum speed nor its flight altitude of 7.5 km was not a problem for most fighters of the time, not to mention the new models of fighters that were beginning to enter service. It is difficult to understand what exactly guided the Soviet army leaders when accepting into service a bomber with such poor characteristics. As a result, all the DB-1s that were built without exception stood idle almost all the time for years on the Voronezh airfield. The only bright moment in the aircraft's career was the 1939 propaganda movie Victory, where the DB-1 bombers played the role of record-breaking aircraft. But their movie star status did not last long, and by 1940 all DB-1 bombers served as training targets and were soon completely destroyed by other Soviet bombers. And this is how the story of the first Soviet chemical bomber, which was meant to spray Europe with poison, ingloriously ended. Of course, the Soviets kept secret the complete failure of the DB-1 bomber, which is why for some time the Soviet aircraft was still considered by Western countries as a capable long-range bomber. Looking back, it is a bit amusing to see the American crowd in 1937 happily watching the landing of these Soviet planes on American soil, planes which in a way were long-range bombers. Which reminds me of another case when landing Soviet aircraft were warmly welcomed. I'm talking about the 1967 incident when a Soviet MiG-21 got lost and accidentally landed on a NATO airfield. If you want to learn more about this fascinating episode of the Cold War, Check out my video, which is now available on my streaming service Nebula. By the way, that's where you can find my other exclusive videos, like the one on the incident known as the Ghost Plane, in which a Soviet Antonov An-12 circled over a city for several hours with an entirely unconscious crew. Or the episode on the Soviets' crazy attempts to mount huge cannons on small fighters, which became known as the recoilless madness of the Surtis or the episode on the Russian art of military cheating, and more episodes are coming. But Nebula is not just home to my content, but also dozens of other unique exclusive bonus projects from more than 200 independent thoughtful creators you probably already know, like Real Life Lore and His Modern Conflicts, or Red Atoms by Real Time History, or Underexposed by Neo. The reason for this constantly increasing number of exclusive top quality videos is that Nebula is a totally different platform without a YouTube-like algorithm and without any ads. So creators on Nebula make their videos not in accordance with advertiser-friendly guidelines, but according to their most ambitious and crazy ideas, which altogether results in amazing videos whose number is growing every day. Along with access to educational content, you also get free access to Nebula classes, where you can take classes from your favorite creators and learn how to become a successful creator yourself. And best of all, if you sign up by clicking the link in the description, you will receive an insane 40% discount for an annual subscription, which means it will only cost you $250 a month for all of this awesome exclusive content from Paper Skies and hundreds of other independent creators. This is the absolute best way to support Paper Skies and enjoy premium content. Thank you so much for watching.